Okay, this week, or this month rather, we will be looking at a library called Wangle from Facebook that they say it makes it easy to write network clients and we will find out how true that statement is as we look at this library so Wangle this is a uh, their github page so um, Facebook took a bunch of their libraries that they wanted to make open source and they've released them under open source and most of the higher level libraries that Facebook has released apparently rely on a bag of random toolbox components that they've packaged into this library called Folly and you see Folly is one of the dependencies of Wangle and we'll take a look at Folly in a second but it uh, like I said it's basically a toolbox it has things like asynchronous socket class, futures, uh, a Facebook string implementation that is optimized for a couple of different scenarios, and some other things like that. So we're going to see uh, Folly Features is going to play an important part in Wangle. And so we'll be taking a look at that library in a little bit. The Fizz library is basically um, their implementation of TLS, which is Transport Layer Security, also known as SSL Secure Session Layer. This is encryption using uh, public key cryptography on a socket connection because when you are using the internet, anybody who can look at the wire on which your data is being transported can look at your data right because they've got access to the wire so remember uh, software security doesn't do you any good if people have physical access physical access to a machine means I can take the hard drive out and take it home right so it doesn't matter what kind of password you've got set up to log in if I can just steal your hard drive so the idea behind TLS is to provide encrypted connections between a client and a server where they agree on a key exchange in such a way that the keys are not fixed. So um, they, there's an initial handshake and if you've ever browsed to a website and it warned you that the certificate was expired or invalid the reason it is wire warning you about that certificate is because the certificate is how we establish a network of trust between our client and a server. So everybody goes and gets a certificate from an authority. Those authorities trust each other and form a web of trust around the authorities that issue the certificates. So we hope, we hope that we can trust those authorities they issue certificates to you know the good people supposedly not malicious people with malicious intent because if they were then they revoke their certificate but they issue those certificates and then those certificates are deployed on websites and the uh, web browser or any kind of secure socket layer will obtain those certificates and validate them and so on so fizz is there we can take a look at their page for fizz here that's on their Facebook so there you notice uh, folly and uh, wangle are both in the main uh, Facebook area but this fizz library is in the Facebook incubator area I'm not exactly sure what's the difference between the incubator and the regular place at any rate this is a transport layer security version 1.3 or uh, yeah, transport layer security version 1.3 implementation um, now, it also uses uh, OpenSSL. Uh, which has a... a OpenSSL is basically um, the secure socket layer portion of the communication. And then TLS is on top of that. 
So uh, Fizz, we won't need to look in any great detail at Fizz. In fact, I'll close that tab. Because basically, it's what gives us a secure connection. And as far as we're concerned, that's all we're interested in is just having a secure connection. We're not interested in the details of how TLS is implemented. Um, their library is built with CMake. But what I found was that it's available through VC package. Uh, did I make this? Yeah, okay. Um, does that font need to be a little bit bigger or is it uh, legible? I can make it a little bigger if it's too small. Just let me know in chat. Um, so with VC package, you the I find the easiest thing to do for trying out these libraries that I've never tried before is just see if VC package supports it because if VC package supports it then VC package can go and get all the source code download all the dependencies get everything all set up and running and that took a while not like hours but it took maybe you know a good 10 15 minutes because it has dependencies on boost either directly through Wangle or transitively through Folly and Fizz. Uh, OpenSSL is available also in, uh, in VC package. Uh, you can see it down here, OpenSSL 1.1.1n. So we're perfectly compliant with their 1.02 plus minimum. Um, but OpenSSL doesn't depend on Boost at all. I can guarantee that. So something in Fizz or Folly or Wangle brought in Boost dependency, and that's fine. Uh, VC package will figure it all out. It'll get the minimal amount of stuff from Boost. Boost is packaged into individual libraries, but those individual libraries have dependencies on other libraries in Boost. So sometimes, you know, it's you, you just think you're getting one library, but you're getting, you know, another 40 or 50 dependent libraries as a result of that transitive dependency. But VC package will figure it all out. So what I did is I have a little directory that I made for my NNTP client that I'm going to use as my use case to try out this library to see you know, is it easy or is it hard? I'm not an expert network programmer, so it, you know, if the library is easy, I should be able to just get things done and have no problems. Now, what I did was make a little VC package manifest. Um, I really just listed Wangle initially, but when I added the examples from Wangle's repository into my little workspace here, one of the examples depended on thrift. Uh, we won't go into detail about thrift, but uh, if you're going to do network clients and servers, and you're not doing something as mundane as HTTP, right? Because if it's HTTP, well, I can get canned libraries that do HTTP requests and responses, and they handle all the details of parsing the response and building the request in such a way that you know, all I'm really interested in is the data. I'm not interested in implementing HTTP from scratch. So if you're not doing something like HTTP, in our case we're not, we're going to talk NNTP, which we'll look at in a second, then it's common that what you're going to do for a remote procedure call style service is you want to have the remote procedure call to the remote server look just like a local procedure call, which means the API that you're consuming, you're going to send data types and structures and classes and you know pointers and references to those into functions. And then somebody has to turn that into a byte stream that is sent over the network. In classic 90s RPC style, uh, client-server interaction, you write a little text file that describes the data structures that are to be turned into byte streams and 
it, it, that process is called serialization, and then deserialization is taking the byte stream and turning it back into a data structure. So obviously, I can't do things like send raw pointers across the wire because a pointer is a, is an address in my local address space. It's not going to make any sense on the other machine to receive a pointer into my local address space because they don't have my address space. It's a different process. It's a different machine. Maybe running a different operating system. So what you have to do is uh, describe your data structures in such a way that they can be serialized and old school remote procedure call uh, clients and servers used a little tool that read your data structure description and spit out a little header file and a little C file that implementation that did the serialization and deserialization. Thrift is a C++ version of that same thing. You write a little description of your data structures which they call an interface definition language. It's not the same as IDL from COM if you've ever done any Windows COM programming but it is an, a, a description of the interface of your data structures and then thrift will generate serializers and deserializers so you can take your application data structures feed it to the serializer and now you've got a byte stream that you can send over a network connection so one of these um, examples depended on thrift so that's the only reason I had thrift in my VC package.json if you're just writing your own code and you don't want to try and build those examples that come with Wangle, you don't need a dependency on Thrift. But just Thrift is uh, something we might do a talk on later because it's kind of interesting all by itself. The idea of how do I provide a rich data structure, serialization, and deserialization scheme. Okay, so using this VC package manifest, I was able to configure a build. I've got it up here in my little build folder. Oops, CD build. And um, in fact, it's probably easier to browse this way uh, by folder view. So when you configure a project with VC package using a manifest, it downloads the source code and uh, builds the uh, libraries in a shared space and then it copies the the result of the build into your build fo build folder so you see here in this VC package installed x64 windows and we look at the include directory you can see I've got a directory here for wangle for thrift and then all the other stuff that came down as the dependencies of my other libraries. Here's Folly. Here's all the stuff for Boost. You can see it pulled in like, I don't know, 40 or 50 different Boost libraries. Most Boost libraries don't need to be compiled. They're header-only libraries, so it's not necessarily a big deal that there's 40 of those libraries in there. It doesn't add to your link time. It just adds to uh, the set of header files that are available to you when you build. So you can also see here's the Folly library. It's got subdirectories for uh, Kronos. This is stuff dealing with date and time, stuff dealing with compression, concurrency. If we look down in IO and drill into async, we'll see things like async socket, async SSL socket. So Folly, uh, along the, we're going to use, end up using the uh, classes in that IO directory through Wangle and we're also going to end up using these uh, futures classes which we will talk about in a moment because when you're doing network communication client server communication client server API you may request a connection to a remote machine but it may not answer so it may time out it may it, it may be under heavy load so even though you connect can connect to it it may not give you answers in a timely fashion so it may take a while for it to give you a response uh, the request that you made may it could just be that it had to do a lot of processing and it's going to send a lot of data in response to a request that you made and that data isn't going to arrive all at once 
or it may not arrive at even a regular rate, internet congestion could cause the packets to collide and have to be retransmitted and so on. So all of this is very um, much influenced by external factors that control the timing of the interactions between the client and the server. So Wangle's idea is to use futures and asynchronous communication to represent the interaction between the client and the server. So um, that's that's like the hundred thousand foot view and we'll take a look at like a fifty thousand foot view in a second but I want to draw your attention right now to the fact that on their github page their continuous integration build is failing so that's not a good sign for an open source library if we uh, click on the little continuous integration badge we see that oh the failures aren't uh, recently uh, it, it's not just recent the, these these uh, workflows ran two years ago and all these workflows are red and if we go to the oldest workflow that's three years ago and it's and they're also they're all red so somebody is not loving this library at Facebook or at least its presence on github um, it's kind of rotting right this is not a good sign when the continuous integration is failing and the failures have been consistent for a long time the other thing that's a little bit disconcerting as a first impression is if we go and look at this a library's commit history um, okay commits on April 13th that's kind of a good sign that means somebody's been committing recently uh, but we look at all the commits and they're all done by a bot and they're all just uh, manipulating the git submodules because one of these uh, libraries that the build system is depending on has changed a hash so and they're probably got it set up to automatically always build from head so that they don't lag on their um, dependencies that they are tracking via github submodules or git submodules rather so they've uh, got a bot that goes in and updates the hash whenever one of these sublibraries gets revised. In this case, it looks like it's fizz. Okay, so um, it's not completely orphaned, but so far the only activity we see on this project is from bots. Uh, and if we go down, okay, here's one that looks like it's a contribution by an actual person. So if we go look at that, I assume this dash meta means they're a Facebook employee because Facebook renamed itself to meta. Uh, but if we look at this, it's also it's build fiddling. It's not it's not a change to the library source code itself. Uh, it's just somebody doing build maintenance. Uh, we keep going back. Uh, update G log to 0 0.5. Okay, that's more build maintenance stuff. So this isn't looking good for this library. Uh, just right off the bat, first impressions. The continuous integration build is busted. It's been busted for three years. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody's making any real contributions to this library. It's just all automatic commits and uh, commits revolving around build dependencies. So that's disconcerting. If we um, go down here into the readme, they say there's a tutorial that explains the basic of Wang, basics of Wangle and how to build an Echo client server, and we will look at that example in a little bit. Um, and then down here in documentation, I mean, it's it's pretty sparse. Um, there's a you know these server bootstrap is a co is a class in their library um, but it's not doxygen so it's not I mean it's manually written right so it's not being generated from doxygen comments tracking the code not that the code is appears to be changing uh, much at all in the repository um, there this futures link takes us over to the 
futures directory in the folly library which is I mean in a certain sense the source code is the documentation but um, I really would prefer written documentation we'll see that they're actually although they're linking to that code directory there is some uh, documentation on futures in uh, folly which we will look at in a second um, okay, so it's it's not looking good, and then, I mean, just first impression wise, and then for their main description, they're saying it's like Netty plus Finagle smooshed together, but in C plus plus. And so I had to, I never heard of Netty or Finagle, and when I went and you know searched around for that, what I found is that Netty is an asynchronous event driven application framework for Java now this is kind of what I want to see in a library right it's got a user guide and then you know detailed information on how to do a client server application in Java with uh, sections broken down Pojo in case you're not familiar with Java coding, it's a plain old Java object, right? So a POJO is kind of equivalent to a pod in C++. Um, okay, so they got um, a user guide and they've got automatically generated Java doc. So Java doc is like Doxygen, right? You it process documentation comments and the interfaces to your classes and you use that to generate an uh, you know documentation browser for all these classes you can see there's you know quite a bunch of classes in here all right so netty looks like what i would expect from a library and wangle just says it's kind of like that other thing and i'm like okay well that's what so so netty if we go back to this top page where they show this block diagram so they've got um zero copy capable rich byte buffer so when you're doing network communication you have to receive the bytes from the network and stick them somewhere before you can do anything with the data right obviously but in processing the data you don't want to be taking that underlying byte stream and copying it around all the time as you turn it into strings or other data types or whatever I mean, obviously, if you're going to take the byte stream and parse text into an integer, obviously that integer has to live somewhere else. It's not going to live in the bytes that are the text representation of the integer. But, for instance, in HTTP, uh, every HTTP request consists of a, a header and a body. The header is all text. The body may or may not be text, but it's going to be a byte stream. And we're going to have to take that header and parse the text representation of the header that looks like the headers on a mail message on an email message uh, which is SMTP protocol but in HTTP it's very similar and it's also very similar in NNTP but somebody has to take that text and, and turn it into some kind of you know representation but oftentimes they need to go back and refer to the original data stream because it's got uh, arbitrary name value pairs and the you know the names are important because they're standardized but the values are freeform text or some kind of other text representation that has to be further parsed like an email address or something like that so you don't want to be copying all that data around all the time so this zero copy capable rich byte buffer what that's doing is underneath it's receiving the byte stream and then being it's able to take those received bytes chop them up into into ranges that are a view into that buffer and the views are, co are cheap to copy around and they share the underlying buffer storage so this is fairly common in network applications I didn't drill into this but that's what I infer this to mean uh, you can share references to ranges in this byte buffer but when you share the references it's not copying the bytes so that's the zero copy um, Universal Communication API, this is probably uh, 
giving you TCP sockets, UDP sockets, uh, and so on. This extensible event model is where the asynchronous part starts uh, coming into play, right? So if you're a client, you connect to a server, you register some kind of callback or something so that when something interesting happens on the server, your callback gets invoked. And that's the same idea as sending you an event, right? If you were writing a GUI application, you can't control what, when or how often you get interactions from the mouse or the keyboard, they arrive to you in the form of events from the outside world. So on top of that core infrastructure, they've built um, protocol support for a bunch of different protocols. And over here you see socket and datagram transport services, uh, HTTP tunnel. Socket and datagram is, um, the socket is a reliable communication stream in the sense that uh, it generally, well, a socket could be connected to either TCP or it could be connected to UDP. TCP is a reliable byte-oriented protocol. So if a network transmission error or something happens during the transmission of data stream with TCP, it automatically retries and negotiates error correction between the client and the server. That adds extra overhead to the protocol. UDP, which is a uh, so-called uh, datagram protocol it just sends the bytes out on the network and you either get them or you don't and if you don't get them it's too bad our uh, UDP does not provide a guarantee that all the bytes that are sent will arrive and it also doesn't guarantee that they'll arrive in the same order that they were sent because intermittent network congestion can cause bits of the data stream to get jammed up and so you could receive datagram 2 before you receive datagram 1. Whereas with TCP IP, the extra processing in the protocol guarantees that you will receive the data in the order that it was transmitted. And if a communication error occurred, it will, TCP will um, enforce retransmit. And if a lot of errors are occurring, TCP will stop accepting uh, new bytes into the stream because it hasn't gotten enough acknowledgments for the old bytes that it was trying to send. So it'll it'll start blocking on the sender side if reception is jammed up. Probably more than you want to know about network protocols. There's there's lots of layers to all this stuff. You can go all the way down. Um, there's a good book uh, if you're interested in all the details of all these like protocols and how the encryption works and how it guarantees a secure connection. There's a, a really good book. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the title. It's uh, it, with the, he implements the entire HTTP and TCP/IP and UDP network stack everything in C and shows you uh, how it goes as he is implementing it. I think it's just called like. Implementing Open SSL or SSL. I'm going to search for it here, and if I can, yes, this is the book. Um, implementing SSL TLS using cryptography and uh, PKI, which is public key infrastructure. Um, so, if you're interested in the details of all this stuff and how it all works. You can see I bought it in 2014. I thought it was a good read. So if that's something that interests you, um, that would be the way that I would suggest you drill down to details. So back to Wangle. Um, OK, continuous integration builds failing. Commit history looks unloved. Um, they're saying it's like these Java libraries. We looked at what Netty was providing us. What's, what's Finagle, which is the other library that they mentioned? What's Finagle giving us? Uh, this is an extensible RPC system for the JVM. RPC being remote procedure call. So if we drill into their user's guide here, take a look at their uh, quick start. Uh, was looking for any, something that... Uh, we'll see that some of this terminology, services, filters, and so on, has parallels over in Wangle. Um, 
because they're saying it's like finagle and it's like netty but the problem is that uh, I don't want to have to reverse engineer a, a Java library description to figure out what my C++ library is doing. And just because it's like that doesn't mean that the semantics that are being described here on the library for Java are the same as the semantics being described for Wangle. So, a um, little bit disconcerting. Not what I would prefer if we look at their tutorial. So they describe a pipeline. So when you are doing network communication, what you transmit and receive at the network level is just a raw stream of bytes. But a raw stream of bytes, to be useful, needs to have some kind of semantic interpretation applied to it. Usually this is... Um, prescribed by the protocol, but if you're doing your own remote procedure call uh, from scratch type thing, then you're the, you're the one that's just, you know, assigning semantics to what these bytes mean. Uh, in the chat, uh, someone says, uh, for networking fundamentals, computer networks by Tannenbaum. Uh, that's also a good reference. Uh, the, I like that book that I showed because uh, he goes through a complete implementation, not necessarily an implementation that you know is doing all the error checking and is the most efficient in the world but it is implemented in a straightforward way so that you will understand every single layer of the protocol stack okay so back to uh, what a pipeline is so from a programming perspective what you want to do is take this raw byte stream and through some kind of code processing lift up the semantics from raw bytes to request and response and then further into what it means th uh, for the application logic for whatever kind of application you're writing. So um, they're saying a pipeline is a chain of request and response handlers that handle upstream handling the request and downstream handling the response. So upstream is the data you send and downstream is the data that you get. And they have a mechanism for composing handlers together to create a pipeline. We'll see that in code. So the idea of an echo server is um, you send it, you send the echo server some bytes, it sends you those bytes back. That's all it does. It just echoes what it received. Now, because this is client-server communication, we have to write the server that receives the bytes and sends them back, and the client that sends some bytes to be echoed and gets the response back from the server. So, in the server, they're saying they're going to write uh, a handler that adapts a stood string. So, this is the very... Um, I was going to say the very end, but that's probably not the right way to describe it. So this is um, this doesn't seem. Oh, okay. It, this is just a diagnostic message. It receives a string from the client. You know, so it's reading. This is the server. So when it reads, it's reading data from the client. So it receives a string, and it just writes it back out, and it uh, puts a. Uh, carriage return, new line, sequence on the end of the whatever it got. So it is uh, syncing stood strings. It's, re you know, it's receiving stood strings, acting as a sync. It's reading them, and, do and then it just turns around and writes them back out. Um, now they have a pipeline factory, which is where all these handlers are chained together. So they start by just creating an empty pipeline and then they're going to add handlers onto the back. So the first thing they do is add on an asynchronous socket handler. Then they add on this line-based frame decoder. So line-based frame decoder is taking the raw byte stream, interpreting it as a sequence of lines of text that are delimited by carriage return line feed.
and so it's taking that raw buffer of data that's arbitrary size and it's it's adapting that into strings that represent individual lines of text um, their string codec I think that I, I didn't drill into the details on that they say that is receiving a byte buffer and and uh, decoding it into a stood string okay so the line based frame decoder uh, takes the incoming incoming byte buffer and splits it up into lines but it's still a uh, a byte buffer it's not yet a stood string so then the string codec takes the byte buffer and turns it into a stood string and passes that to the echo handler the echo handler is what the code that we looked at that was written for this server specifically it receives a stood string and writes it into the pipeline which will send the message downstream okay um, that's not too hard to digest I mean this is a chain of handlers that is lifting the semantics of these raw bytes coming in off the network uh, one small step at a time so because of the fact that each of these handlers is doing one focused task it means their likelihood for being reused and recombined and as we write more clients is high so that's good this is a small focused components with loose coupling so that's good and we had to uh, write our own little handler here this code um, I'm a little bit concerned that we haven't learned what this context is yet and we're inheriting from template based classes that I don't know what they're doing and uh, you know I don't know quite yet what this read and write contract looks like obviously this is a method that we're overriding in our derived class so it must be a virtual method somewhere in the hierarchy that comes from handler adapter but you know it's just tutorial we're just getting started it, it's okay to not know all these details up front there's a similar thing going on here with this uh, pipeline factory that's another template class um, and it is taking an echo pipeline which we haven't seen yet in this little tutorial um, so now they're saying all that needs to be done is to plug this all together and, and bootstrap it up to get the final server okay um, this little define int thing if you haven't seen that before that's the, coming from this G flags library we're bringing in server bootstrap async socket handler line based frame decoder and string codec all from wangle and so here's our uh, echo handler that we saw before here's the pipeline factory that we saw before and uh, the echo pipeline which we wondered where that came from is defined as a pipeline parameterized on some kind of uh, IO buff queue and a stood string and if you look in the documentation this is the um, data type that is fed into the pipeline and this is the the data type that comes out of the pipeline so it's just the in and the out types the IO buff queue is that zero copy buffer mechanism that we saw talked about in the Java library that's their own version of that so down here in the main uh, use G flags to parse command line flags it turns out that by using this define in 32 thing gives you an automatic way to glue into this command line parser so that um, if you give this little program dash dash help it'll tell you it's got a, a flag called port that the help description for it is echo server port and the default value is 8080 so that's a just boilerplate command line argument parsing and then here we get down into the interesting part so this server bootstrap we haven't really learned what that is yet I mean it's uh, oops uh, they're just saying take your factory and plug it into the server bootstrap and you're good to go and I'm like okay but I don't know what this server bootstrap thing is doing yet so we're going to instantiate one of those for our pipeline uh, we're gonna give it our pipeline factory an instance of our pipeline factory 
as a shared pointer to set the child pipeline child pipeline um, we're gonna bind to the port that was specified either by default value or through a command line argument now if you haven't done network programming before the action of binding for a server so when a server wants to accept requests or sorry when a server wants to accept connections from clients first they have to connect then they can exchange requests and responses but to connect to a server you have to specify the IP address of the server that you want to connect to either by host name which goes through DNS domain name system lookups to get the host name resolved into an IP address or you can give it the IP address directly but in addition to that you have to tell it what port you want to connect on now there's a, it's a 16-bit value the port so it can, you know it can have 65,536 possible ports the ports that are numbered below 1024 are uh, secured and they have standardized meanings so for instance NNTP the protocol we will look at in a little bit that we're interested in relies on port 119 because it's been standardized through uh, the so-called request for comments process on the internet and if you're writing your own client server you shouldn't be unless you're implementing one of those standard services you shouldn't be using a port number below 1024 so that's why their default value for the port was 8080 um, and above 1024 there's no standardized agreement on um, what those ports mean and what they should be used for so if you're going to have your own private uh, protocol uh, you know that's specific to your application you really want that port number to be configurable because chances are you know if you, like 8080 is one that gets used a lot because port 80 has been standardized for HTTP for web servers so when people want to have other web servers hanging around on their network that they're going to use for private reasons they often use 8080 as the um, port number for such a web server so you always want to have your port number be configurable so that you can use one that's available in case somebody else is uh, already using one that you had as your default so when a server is ready to accept connections it binds to the port and that means that the network infrastructure that understands TCP IP networking on your machine uh, in in Unix this is handled through some kind of daemon it's usually the case that accepting connections from the outside go to a daemon and then that daemon hands it off to the program that services that requests on that port so you bind to the port and then when a client connects you'll be notified that it has bound to your port and it, you will have the IP address of the machine that is connecting to you and so th so that you can talk back you know respond to the client that is connected to you now um, what's interesting about ports is you bind to them but as soon as the connection is established another client can come in and request to connect to the same machine on the same port and this is why in a high performance network client server uh, application you'll be using a thread pool on the server side so that you can process multiple connections concurrently I means time slice concurrency but uh, maybe if you have multiple CPUs running it's you know got CPU parallelism so binding is how you say I'm a server I'm listening on this port for connections and then they're uh, doing this uh, wait for stop um, on the which means the clients gonna or sorry the servers gonna run until it's been told to stop so it's gonna continue to receive incoming connections now uh, on the plus side 
all we did was declaratively say what our server is going to do. We didn't have to write any, you notice we didn't write any code about handling incoming connections and we didn't write any code that said um, here is my execution strategy for incoming connections. Is it single threaded handling? I, I'm just going to have one single thread and anybody else trying to obtain a connection is basically going to have to wait while I'm processing requests for somebody else? Or is it multiple threads in a single process? Or is it multiple processes or, or what have you? We didn't specify any of that. So somebody chose some defaults uh, for all those kinds of policy decisions that we might want to have a say in. And um, the other thing you notice here is that because we used uh, asynchronous socket handlers, none of the code that we wrote in here was synchronous the only thing that looked um, frankly procedural at all was this implementation of the read method that you know did a little diagnostic and then it echoed the message back uh, for the client it's similar they have an echo handler as well but here the read method is from the other side of the communication, right? So when it's reading in the client, we're reading data sent by the server. So the client says, I received back this text from the server. And there's no write of data here, right? Uh, this is just all the, uh, the read handling on the client side. Um, and, you know, they're handling end of file, which is when the socket gets closed on you, either because the remote server closed the socket or just there was some kind of, you know, you know, maybe the machine went down. So it didn't close the socket cleanly, but the machines crashed. And so there's that all the socket connections are busted. Um, there's also a read exception. And you'll notice there's this thing here, exception wrapper. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk a little bit more about uh, futures in a little bit here. Uh, so far, we, we know this library is using Folly Futures, but we haven't really seen the futures appear anywhere in this code yet, um, which is interesting, right? That means futures are a bit of a mind bender. So, you know, maybe if we don't have to deal with futures all the time, it could make this library easier to understand. Uh, from the point of view of the client, it's going to do a pipeline factory similar to what we saw from the server. Uh, it's also, they've chosen to call it echo handler here, but it's a different class, right? It's not, it's not the same echo handler that we saw up here for the server. So this is the echo handler on the server. It's kind of unfortunate they chose the same name for the class, but they, all these handlers then you know named whatever handler so down here in the clients pipeline factory same thing create a, a an empty pipeline async socket handler event base handler and then they have this comment here saying ensure we can write from any thread now when I read a uh, event base handler th that does to me that doesn't scream out you know writing from any thread, which is why they had to put this explanation here in a comment. But this is usually a sign. If you, if you have to explain to the reader that this thing called X means that we can do Y, it probably shouldn't be named X. It should be named Y. It should be named something that indicates why we're doing this so I don't have to write a comment there to explain it to the reader. This is kind of API nitpicking by me. All right. And the next thing we're going to do is uh, line-based frame decoder again. String codec to turn those zero copyable byte buffer uh, values into std strings. So that actually, you know, that, that did a copy of the data. Maybe that's not such a good thing in a high performance scenario, but this is just a simple example. So we're going to um, be okay with it. And then it goes into the echo handler which is taking a std string as the message. 
Now we could have gotten rid of this uh, string codec entirely if we'd written our uh, echo handler to receive these uh, IO buff cues directly or maybe it's an IO buff directly but let's continue on with the example um, to be honest I'm not sure what that finalized method does but you know maybe this is a kind of two-phase construction where you um, configure an object and then you tell it finalized to tell it that you're finally done configuring uh, same command line parsing thing now we have a client bootstrap instead of that server bootstrap and here they've made it a little bit more explicit about how this stuff is being handled they've got an IO thread pool executor coming from the folly library so from this name I infer that it's managing a pool of threads and uh, requests are going to be executed on the uh, one of the threads uh, from that pool as we make requests or perhaps it's the that the uh, responses will be handled by one of the threads on that pool um, it's not entirely clear just from looking at the example which which one it is maybe it's both uh, we've got our pipeline factory glued in like before and now instead of doing a bind we do a connect uh, we're connecting to the um, internet address corresponding to this host and that port a socket address represents a pair of IP address and port as I mentioned before that's how you specify a specific service you want to connect to the service being identified by the port on a particular machine that being identified by the IP address so we did connect uh, but then there's this dot get at the end and if you're familiar with features from other languages or the standard library um, get indicates we took a thing that was asynchronous so this operation returned uh, a future that represented an, uh, a value that will be available to us at some arbitrary time later but it gives us the future immediately and when we call get that basically says block and wait until you got the answer now this is the first time we've seen explicitly in the code that we've been looking at any kind of indication of asynchronous behavior so this thing connecting to a remote socket I'm uh, sorry connecting to a remote machine on a specific port this is an asynchronous operation because we don't know how long it's going to take first of all if we have to do a DNS lookup to turn a host name into an address the DNS lookup itself can take a significant amount of time because uh, DNS name resolution operates through a hierarchy of DNS servers and those DNS servers are controlled by independent authorities that both have a th they all have authority over the subset of the domain name system that they manage so for instance if I'm going to hosts on xmission.com there's some name server that represents the authority for the com top level domain so first I have to go to the com top level domain and say you know do you have an xmission.com and they say yes here's here's the name information for xmission I say great within the xmission.com response is information about who to ask about names within the xmission.com domain so who's the authority for xmission.com it's not the same as the authority for the com top level domain it's another authority now X mission could be their own authority for their own domain or they may use a, a domain registrar to register their host names with that third-party registrar but somebody is the authority and it's not necessarily the same authority as who knows about the top-level com domain and so on and so on you chase this all the way down till you've resolved every component of the host name and then you get an IP address so that can be a lengthy operation um, so this 
if you drill into the documentation for this socket address class, it actually says this first argument is always interpreted as an IP address unless you give an optional third parameter that is a boolean that says true or false and the default is false. So buried in here is an assumption that this uh, host parameter here must be an IP address. Now they've used uh, <coughs> colon colon one which I believe is an IPv6 style uh, text form of an address that represents an address on the local machine. So they didn't need to do a DNS lookup, but in my little example, you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk to the new server on X mission, so I needed to do uh, something else. Okay, continuing on. But we, this, this uh, connect was an operation that could take a long time, so they, uh, in order to not block, they returned back a future but in this uh, simple client code, we're gonna we can't do anything until the connect has completed anyway. So we're gonna do get on the future to force the result to have been obtained. It's either uh, success, which gives us a pipeline, or it's an exception, which throws. And huh, they had bad, uh, you know, practice here. This try should be like the very first thing after the main function begins. So we can catch any exception that might be thrown by this asynchronous operation. But oh, continuing on, we're going to read a line of input from the console. If it's empty, we'll just break out of this loop. It's a uh, while true loop, so it's going to go forever. We'll take that text we got from the console. We'll write it into the pipeline, and the and writing into the pipeline again is an asynchronous operation that's returning a future to simplify things they've just done a get immediately um, if you typed in the word buy as your input then it will close the pipeline and break out of the loop well what's interesting is up here we broke out of the loop but we didn't close the pipeline so it, I'm not, I think obviously the pipeline will close itself if we exit the whole scope and all these objects get destroyed but it, it's unclear why we did it here but not up here um, so this quick tutorial sure it demonstrated how to write a client it showed us that uh, when we're sending information off off to the network those operations are asynchronous and they're returning futures didn't it, it, uh, explain much um, of the details of these things but it's just a quick tutorial right so you kind of think like, okay, great, that's a quick tutorial. Now I'd like to, um, you know, find more. And the deeper documentation is really skimpy. And like I said, I'm not <clears throat> an expert in network programming, uh, nor have I used Folly before, nor have I used these Java libraries that they are referencing. And as I said, uh, they're not saying this library is semantically identical to these other Java libraries. They're saying it's like those libraries. So I can't trust the documentation on those other libraries to explain to me ex exactly what this implementation is doing. Um, they have a little bit of documentation in here, but it's, it's skimpy and I don't really trust it because it's not generated from Doxygen and even Doxygen comments can drift away from the implementation over time but at least it's better than a markdown file that apparently nobody has touched in multiple years so this is the, there's some red flags going on with this library but let's let's kind of remain optimistic and, and take a look at what the code would be like so over here uh, Let's just look at this in Explorer. Okay, so I I didn't need to, but because I wanted to reference their um, it, you know their source code as I was uh, learning the library, I cloned their uh, library Wangle from GitHub uh, 
um, I cloned the thrift library because one of their examples was using it I cloned the folly and fizz libraries and it, so far I haven't needed to look inside fizz I, I just I thought for completeness I would download the main dependencies uh, as git clones but none of none of these directories are actually being used in my build at all in my uh, this is my little code that I created so I have a basic CMake list and that package JSON we looked at inside here is my little attempt at making an NNTP client and in the example folder I just copied in all of their stuff and threw a CMake build around it so if we look at that in Visual Studio let's get this get this little thing hiding out here we don't need that okay so here is their echo client um, just like it showed in that tutorial uh, let's make this a little bigger let's make it bigger still okay uh, so here's their um, echo client and <coughs> their <coughs> excuse me their echo server so I've built these and let's go back over here uh, so I've got them in the build directory and we need to go into I've got them built debug so inside here is the echo client and the echo server now obviously if I want to show the echo client running I have to start the echo server somewhere so I'm gonna start it locally right here let it let it talk so um, might be best if I do like this so we can see it so now if I run the echo client so here's the client and I say hello the server says handling hello and the client gets the hello echoed back okay so that's working uh, if I say bye oh nice access violation so this is this is also not a good sign for this library uh, let's see what's going on here let's get the call stack over I ran this in release mode when I was uh, testing I didn't I didn't get this uh, access violation atomic notification queue event based atomic notification queue it's it's uh, it's not happy with this I bet something got yank yeah see they were running in a destructor so we're destroying an async socket handler I bet something got yanked out from underneath and then it tried to manipulate it and that's why we got an access violation but this is just a guess right I, I didn't write this code I don't want to debug this code I just want to use this code to see if I can get my own stuff done so uh, another another red flag that we've come across let's try and look at um, oh what I wanted to mention is okay so this echo client it's pretty simplistic right it's fine um, but it, what's weird is you notice the thing that's handling the response from the server is not here it's up here in this read method right this is the thing that's getting back the response and this is the thing that's sending the request they're in two completely different places in the code and normally in my mind what I wanted was uh, a class that encapsulates my service and all this networking details so that clients of my um, class in my application 
don't need to care about networking, right? You want to have the networking code in one place and then have everybody else just treat it like a class. That's the idea of remote procedure call. You make the procedure call on the remote machine just the same way you would make a procedure call on the local machine. So the whole idea is to hide all this network junk inside something else and I wasn't seeing that in this implementation of the echo client and I, I wasn't understanding how I mean here I've got access to the pipeline and I'm sending data into the pipeline but the data is coming out of the pipeline in another class down in this echo handler and to me that just seemed weird you know I was um, trying to write my own network client that would talk to this remote server and I didn't see how to join these two things it turns out that the way you're supposed to do it is you're supposed to join them into a service which you notice that they didn't really explain on their github page except to say it's like the other library so I'd have to go read up on what a service is in the other library um, if we look in we'll just uh, I've got the because VC package installed all this stuff right I can drill in through VC packages uh, install directory in my build folder and I can browse the headers to wangle you see there's a service folder and then down here is a service.h I can do it that way or I can just you know I had it over here where I cloned it from github they're, they're you know VC package may not use exactly top of tree from github so it may not be the exact same file but we saw from the commit history on this project that like nobody's really committing to it so they're identical but we see in here um, buried in the comment is a service is an asynchronous function from request to future response. It is the basic unit of the RPC interface. Okay, um, it's a uh, virtual class with a function call operator that takes a request and it returns a future of the response. Okay, that makes sense. Um, we haven't really talked about futures yet, so let's go over there okay so we're just gonna qu quickly refresh ourselves on how futures work so it, futures are a, a, a generic way of addressing asynchronous execution now the C++ standard did bring in std future and boost has a future library as well uh, the boost one is very rich the, the std future one is bare bones and that's why Folly Futures exists because <coughs> they want to provide a more uh, f what you would call a fluent API on top of the future mechanism so if you are um, doing traditional kind of uh, synchronous programming so here's an example of you know some synchronous code and this is a memcache client so it's gonna look in the cache and it's either gonna find it or it's not gonna find it or there was some kind of server error and you know the, whatever we looked for is gonna be stashed into this result um, and this uh, sorry this result represents the response you know from the server whether it was successful or not and then the value is stored in this string and when we do a get operation we're going to get one of these replies which has a result and the value now if that that's what it would look like in synchronous programming and a a bare bones asynchronous method might be such that you initiate the operation and you supply a callback to the operation and when the operation completes it invokes your callback so they're showing that here as it's a std function the signature of the callback is returns void and it accepts a get reply get reply is that little struct that they created up here so the callback accepts the reply and returns nothing 
and we register that callback for the operation associated for getting the value associated with this key and the return result from this async get represents some kind of you know potential infrastructure error right you know ran out of threads or who knows what it's just an error code so to do this with futures the idea is um, instead of having these callbacks which if you have a bunch of chained asynchronous operations the callbacks start suddenly getting really out of hand and difficult to manage <coughs> so the idea with the future is encapsulate the asynchronous operation into this future the future represents a value that will arrive at some point the future is either filled with the actual value when it arrives it's filled with an exception if some error occurred while trying to obtain the value and you can copy around the future as much as you like and when you finally need the actual value you can't do anything more with the future except obtain the value by waiting for it you call um, get on the future uh, did they have it up no that's the synchronous one okay uh, in this case they're calling value to obtain the value out of the future um, the person handling the asynchronous response is calling set value on the future to give it a value or it's calling some kind of set error method to set an exception on it now what's interesting about futures is through a little bit of language magic <coughs> when you ask for the value of a future if the future had been filled with an exception instead of the value asking for the value causes that exception that was captured to be thrown now this is interesting because what it means is I can have one thread handling the asynchronous response determining that some error occurred sticking the exception on the future and then that thread is no longer involved in the scenario and the main thread of execution that was waiting on the value of the future gets the exception and it and it throws in the other thread so it's like allowing an exception to be thrown in one thread and caught in another thread that's kind of a way that um, a future can transmit an error value so obviously in the code that is setting the value of the future they have to catch the exception and stick it into the future and it, you can't just let the stack unwind uh, that would be bad because that, that would mean in your thread pool of worker threads you know the threads would be dying every time an exception was thrown so what they do is capture the exception stick it into the future and resolve the future as that exception now that's the basic of any kind of future API is that it either holds on a value or an error you can wait for the value by calling uh, you know, some kind of getter function but what happens um, with the futures in Folly is it gets more interesting is they have a way of saying okay um, I want you to go and have that code that is going to run asynchronously to get the value for this future but I want you to use this particular execution strategy in order to uh, schedule that asynchronous callback so they have in Folly futures the idea of these executors and when I said before we looked at the echo client and obviously there was somebody in there deciding how to schedule that asynchronous callback but we didn't see it explicitly and that's because there was a default executor which is basically a CPU thread pool and uh, that's get used unless you specify your own executor but if you if you want to orchestrate things like for instance on Windows there's only one thread that can interact with the GUI it's the so-called main thread and then the worker threads they can do whatever they want but they can't interact with the Win32 GUI mechanism so you might have an executor that allows you to say this code is going to interact with the GUI so it needs to run on the GUI thread and you can encapsulate that in an executor or you may have uh, 
um, a low priority thread pool and a high priority thread pool and you may want to have some requests go to the high priority thread pool or the low priority thread pool you can do that by associating the features with executors now the more interesting part of their features library in folly is the idea of um, chaining a sequence of actions on a future so what they've done here is they they have some uh, future and if they invoke then value with a lambda if the future is resolved to a value this lambda will be called with the value that was obtained if the future was resolved to an exception then the then error code uh, or the then error uh, method lets you attach a lambda that handles the exception and this then try lets you say okay um, I might have uh, a value or I might have an exception uh, I think I'm oh it's I might be saying this backwards okay then try takes a value which enca encapsulates both the value and the exception but the more interesting thing about this is um, instead of just saying then value you can say you know dot then and that means you can chain uh, oh well here's an example of it so they're saying I'm gonna um, have this future and then when the future gets resolved whatever it got resolved to the value it got resolved to will then do X and then that will turn into um, a future that when it's evaluated will do Y and then it will do Z so using uh, futures and promises you basically can write what looks like sequential code but in fact ends up being a series of asynchronous call chains so I say A then B then C then D that means A B C and D are all asynchronous operations but they need to happen in sequence I can't start B until A has completed but I don't know when A is going to complete B has to complete before C can start and so on so you, this is pretty common with for instance a rest API right you make a rest API call that gets a list so a list of resources that's your first asynchronous operation your next asynchronous operation picks one of those resource identifiers out of the list that was returned and requests the detail on that particular resource for the one that was selected that's your second asynchronous operation you get back the detail values uh, associated with that identified resource now you want to update one of them based on a criteria maybe it, it, it you, know, you get the current state of it and it's not what it needs to be so you need, now you need to set the state on that object so now you've got a third asynchronous operation and so on writing all of that in a callback form gets to be really overwhelming as soon as it becomes more than two or three asynchronous operations chained together so using futures and promises gives you a way to just say do A then B then C then D and the code ends up being cleaner um, and that's good because it means our code becomes more readable now so the documentation here for the folly future is pretty good this is a the brief guide they have uh, a blog post that covers basically what we saw here but in a little bit more detail uh, they get in the blog post they go more into detail about how disgusting it looks when you have to connect all these things up with callbacks okay so folly looks good uh, it, and folly's got documentation for most of the important parts in here it's not 100% complete and it's still not as good as generated doxygen but at least it's got something now <coughs> when we looked at uh, Wangle let's go back here to Visual Studio so 
we saw in the in the echo client that there was a little bit of oops, we're not looking at the right one yet we saw that there was a little bit of these uh, using the futures in here in fact if we drill into the signature on this right method we see that it is returning a either <clears throat> sorry it's returning a folly future type uh, the the future is either um, folly unit this folly unit thing is something that they've uh, if we drill into it they're saying uh, it's basically void for things that return void and the reason they've used folly unit as a type instead of void is void gets kind of treated weird in some kind of uh, in certain va uh, scenarios for template metaprogramming so they've used folly unit to disambiguate there <coughs> so this thing's going to return a future which is why down here they called get the connect method is also it's returning a future but the value of the future is pipeline star so a future returning file unit is a ref is a future that can contain either no value because the value the type of the value is void right I can't declare a member of a class whose type is void that's why they use folly unit or it's an exception so down here we call get but we don't do anything with the value because the return value is void but if get encountered an error then get would result in an exception being thrown which is why they have it inside the try catch all right so that's a lot of details and we still haven't quite figured out how to deal with this wangle library so let's take a look at my attempt here um, and uh, first let's do I will show you what the news the, it turns out that all the um, requests and responses from a news server our text so we can just tell net to it to see what it looks like so um, I will tell net out here so here I am I don't in putty the very first line always has some kind of garbage in it but um, we see here that when we connected to this server it and now it gave us a an initial response without us sending anything in a lot of these older internet style protocols there's a three digit response code 200 means okay um, anything with a five is an error so whatever that junk was that putty had in my communication buffer resulted in a 500 error so this and this is just the banner from the server saying you know who it is and what version of the software it's running All, you know this stuff usually just gets ignored by any kind of news reading client they just look at the 200 to know that the connection's okay and in fact they you know uh, client software isn't going to issue a help command there's not really any use in doing that uh, it's just for uh, humans for debugging so um, one of the things that we can do here now NNTP the network news transport protocol that's the um, protocol that we're using here we're connecting to port 119 via telnet 119 is the news port if I now you, you might think like you know well what's the security on this server if anybody can just you know hook up to it I'm, I'm just you know, coming in from some random address but if we try to go to comp.lang.c++ news group Oh, it says uh, read access is denied and that's because we have to authenticate ourselves. and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say off info is my account and then off screen I'm gonna give it my password and hope I don't show it to you uh, off info pass Okay, auth info user. 
then auth info pass. Apparently, I typed the wrong password in. Okay. Now, let's clear my scroll back and reset the terminal. Okay. You can't see my password anymore. Now, if I say group comp lang C++, it says, okay, gave me a, a success response. Any two, any, any three letter code beginning with two is a success. Um, these are the range of article numbers that are in that news group. So if I say article 1075213, hopefully it's not spam. Okay, so there is that message. Here's my my request, and then the response is a 200. It's 220, but it's a it's a 2xx response, meaning success. And then this um, extra information here is described by the NNTP protocol, and then it gives me the body of that article, which has a header, which is name value pairs, and then after the header is a blank line and then is the body of the article and that body continues and then the end of the freeform body is indicated in this protocol by a single line that contains a dot so that just gives you an idea of what this uh, NNTP protocol looks like I'm going to say quit to quit out of that and so that's kind of what I'm trying to achieve using Wangle and so what I did is I can see I got some experiments going on here that didn't quite work out so here's my pipeline async socket handler event base handler okay uh, poorly named but it is what it is line based frame decoder and then string codec and I had experimented with trying to you know go further and decode these strings into actual structures but uh, I, I wasn't able to get that far in the time available before doing this presentation so um, all I had going on with my string handler is that you know just like the echo handler I was just writing it back out um, there's in this protocol NNTP and HTTP is this way as well the lines are always ended with carriage return line feed it's not um, system specific the protocol specifically says it's always going to be carriage return line feed so just to kind of clean up the output and avoid extra blank lines I was just stripping that off before I send it to standard out and <coughs> I think the thing that I was missing, um, well, let me show you first what I was trying to get at here. So for me, I wanted clients of this class to not be connected directly to networking. Maybe, you know, connected to futures is, is okay because it's inherently asynchronous and I'm okay with features leaking out of my client API because if, if they if I don't expose the asynchronous nature of it then that means I'm not getting maximum concurrency that I might be able to get if the clients could be aware of the asynchronous nature of the operations that they were requesting so um, I'm okay with that but um, I managed to take this and get all of the wangle stuff is gone right it's all buried down in this implementation so I got a factory function here that makes one of these client implementations of that pure virtual interface that's described in the header my client uh, it has a instance of client bootstrap for my pipeline 
and sets IO Thread Pool Executor on it so that all the clients be executing from a thread pool. Sets up the pipeline factory and does a connect to the NNTP server. And probably I should, you know, not have this get in there. I put it in there because I, I kind of wanted the errors to come out immediately when you call the factory function. I kind of thought that was better, but I mean, you're going to connect once and then you're going to issue commands repeatedly. So blocking on the connect is not entirely an unreasonable policy. Um, now what I was missing, I think, is that this thing shouldn't be just um, a pipeline. It should be a service. And the problem I had is if um, if we look at service, okay, because this is saying a service is an asynchronous function from request to future uh, response. That's kind of more like what I wanted. The problem is if we go to look at who gives us an example of what a service would look like, okay, RPC service in the RPC server example implements a service oh but I've got red text on the screen that means that even though I told CMake let's open the CMake here even though these RPC client they depend on this thrift library so I did find package thrift I got thrift installed through VC package. I do a find package on thrift in CMake to get the include directory setting correct and all that stuff and the links requirements all satisfied and I depend on the thrift target but they were using non-public API pieces of thrift in their example so they're pulling in stuff from Thrift's unit testing framework that's internal to Thrift. It's not part of Thrift's public API. So I thought, okay, well maybe I can hack around that if I go and clone Thrift, which I did. The problem is that their example is so old that Thrift has now moved on and none of these things exist, exist in Thrift anymore. Or if they exist, they exist under different names. And so that's why I can't get this code to compile. So their only example that they provide of a thing that implements a service can't be built. So another disappointing thing. So that's about as far as I was managed to penetrate into this library in about three days of intense study. And I'm, I am don't think I'm a dummy or anything, but I just don't think this library is ready for prime time. Uh, which is disappointing because I like its architectural choices. I just don't like the fact that it's basically uh, shovelware, abandonware, whatever you want to call it. You know, they kind of shoveled it out onto the internet and, and it's just kind of languishing. And what's really kind of disappointing is you, you see like... Uh, 2,800 people have starred this library and 500 people have forked it and 180 people are watching what happens on it. So it's not like there's no interest, uh, but it, it just doesn't seem like this library is being maintained at all. Um, I, I, I bet if I... Do they have a... I bet if I went in and tried to build it using their crazy build system, which you notice they're top level, they don't have like a CMake list or anything. They're not using, I mean, they have a CMake list down in here, but they're using this FB code builder thing, which is some Facebook build tool. I don't know. That's the thing that keeps getting updated with their. Um, bot that's updating the hashes of the sub repos 
So it's got a crazy build. It uh, doesn't appear to be getting maintained. It's got a whole bunch of issues that are open. And if we sort these issues by like uh, recently updated, we see that, you know, thing was uh, updated 25 days ago. It's the most recent one that was updated. But basically there's a bunch of stuff in here that people are saying stuff doesn't work or I'm having this problem and I'm not seeing much interaction on those issues with the developers. You know, make failed on CentOS 7. CentOS 7 is not some crazy uh, obscure Linux distribution. Um, the person got a build failure. You know, could be easy to solve, but it's it's been, uh, you know, it's been open for four years, and it's been getting ignored. So, um, my conclusion is, unless you are already familiar with these Java libraries. Oh, let's get back up here to the main page. You know, maybe this code makes sense if you're a Java developer that has already used these other things. But there are other um, much more capable network libraries out there that are more well documented. And, you know, we're going to look at some of those in the next couple of months. I wanted to look at this one because I thought, you know, hey, uh, features and promises to handling async stuff. Um, and when I, you know, skimmed it over before for consideration, it seemed like it was good. But you know, once I tried to use it, I found it very difficult, <laughs> a little bit frustrating, as you might have imagined. Um, now, that's just Wangle that I'm down on. Folly looks to be much more usable it's not as documented as I would like, but it's at least better documented. And um, if we drill into, say, Folly, I.O., Async, if we look, for instance, at uh, Async Socket Header. Okay. This is more what I was expecting. I don't mind going and looking at the header files to get some documentation, which these header files in Folly actually have. But hardly any of the classes are documented in anything other than if they have any documentation, it's cursory, and most of the classes don't have any documentation at all in the Wangle library. But if we look inside here, you know, we've got Doxygen. Uh, comments on the individual methods telling us what's supposed to be going on and uh, you know almost every class has a comment on the class or if it's not on the class it's on the individual methods to tell you what should be going on so th this is okay I the fact that I, I'm surprised they don't have a doxygen you know, GitHub workflow running that's pushing to the, the GitHub pages associated with Folly, but it's okay. Um, I don't mind reading header files for documentation. But if we go back to Wangle and we look at Wangle's header files, so let's say. Uh, channel so handler context okay boilerplate copyright comment and some to do comments and then a bitch about windows and that's it there's no documentation in here at all I don't know what any of this stuff is supposed to be doing how it works how it fits into the architecture um, that you know so that's important for me to adopt a library I have to understand how it works without having to reverse engineer it line by line if I'm going to reverse engineer it line by line I'll go find another library that I can use um, obviously people have interest given the uh, you know the counts here and the fact that it is in we don't need that the fact that it's in oops you know it's in VC package so that means somebody cared enough to provide a, pa a port to VC package and push that in. Um, 
you can also find folly in here if you just want to depend on folly and uh, you notice in here the little options and square brackets this is so you can get the base library and then you can add on some optional components uh, if you if you want to use those as well so overall I'd say this library looks interesting from an architectural perspective but from a practical perspective it's a complete fail uh, it seems to be abandonware um, we're gonna look at you know I've been kinda doing these uh, clumps of presentations on a related topic so we're gonna look at some more networking libraries in the coming two months I don't know exactly what that's going to be yet it might be POCO which is uh, not just networking but it's it's a lot of it's an application framework POCO but that's enough I don't, I don't hope this didn't sound like uh, you know just me complaining about this library for two hours or however long but that's enough for this library if there's questions we can take that via audio or in chat Okay, then we will wrap it up here.